Uh, great. So um, what I'm going to talk about now is uh, a part of our work that's most relevant to neurodevelopmental disorders. And we are particularly interested in gene environment interactions and more recently in epigenetics. And so pretty much all major psychiatric disorders have their origins in neurodevelopment, particularly with respect to risk and resilience. So I wanted to start off um, by introducing, I'm going to very briefly talk about one tan repeat um, disorder, but I wanted to raise this um, area, which I think is relevant to pretty much anyone interested in neurodevelopment, including neurodevelopmental disorders. So many people don't realize that approximately half of the human genome is repetitive DNA or repeatome. And within that, there's approximately 1.5 million discrete tandem repeats. And the one relevant to our work in recent years has been a CAG repeat that encodes attractive glutamines in a protein called Huntington, which when expanded causes Huntington's disease. Now for the other 1.5 million repeats, we really don't know much about uh, what they do. It's uh, really an open area, but clearly based on comparative genomics, uh, there's been a lot of constraints on their evolution and we think they're, they're very important. Excitingly, in recent years, uh, beyond the over 50 monogenic tandem repeat disorders, these more common uh, complex disorders like autism and schizophrenia have been linked to a bunch of different tandem repeats and particularly tandem repeat polymorphisms and mutations. Um, so the implication here is not just for autism and schizophrenia, but the implication being that many of these tan repeats have evolved to regulate specific aspects of brain development. And we have no idea how, but it's, I think, rich fodder for anyone interested in the genetics of brain development and of uh, neurodevelopmental disorders. So moving on to an area where we have done a lot of work, and that's um, Huntington's disease, which is the most common of at least nine so-called polyglutamine diseases. As I mentioned, the expansion of the CAG repeat in Huntington causes a polyglutamine expansion in the Huntington protein. And uh, this causes a, um, a toxic gain of function, the neurodegeneration, which we've mainly been modeling in the mice. But we do think in Huntington's, there may be a neurodevelopmental component and we've been looking at that um, through um, a different model, which we've generated using CRISPR gene editing, uh, which I won't go into today, but we think there is a kind of neurodevelopmental component that's associated with a change of function uh, with the expansion of the polyglutamine within Huntington. Across these other more than 50 monogenic tandem repeat disorders, uh, Fragile X syndrome is a major neurodevelopmental disorder, but there are a couple of others that have neurodevelopmental components as well. Okay, this will be uh, my only brief discussion of Huntington's disease, but to introduce it, the main environmental factors that we started with were cognitive stimulation and physical activity. And one way to manipulate these in rodent models, and we're focused on mouse models, is relative to standard housing conditions, which generally have uh, unlimited food and water and bedding, and usually other mice of the same sex. Uh, the environmental rich conditions increase novelty and complexity so as to increase levels of sensory stimulation, cognitive stimulation, and opportunities for voluntary physical activity. So in the very first experiments I did with my first PhD student, we took our transgenic mouse model of Huntington's disease, which expressed the human Huntington mutation, hence had excellent genetic construct validity, but also excellent face validity. We were over, able to show over a range of different tests. And we randomized at weaning, in this case, four weeks of age, into either environmentally enriched or standard house condition, both the HD and the wild type mice to see what might happen. And until we did these experiments, Huntington's was one of these monogenic disorders, which was considered the epitome of genetic determinism. It was considered 100% genetic. And so we we're kind of blown away by these initial findings. As expected, the wild type normal mice 
in both environmental groups never showed a deficit on this motor task, this horizontal rod task of motor coordination, which we know is sensitive to motor deficits in this HD model. So as expected, um, by five months of age, because 95% of Huntington's cases are adult onset, the other 5% have um, juvenile onset. And so in these mice, the standard house, as expected, 100% showing motor deficits by that five months of age, a dramatic delay in this uh, motor end phenotype in the mice. And we were able to show uh, that the Dementia and depression-like behaviours are delayed also by environmental enrichment. And our colleagues showed independently in other models that uh, environmental enrichment is beneficial. And in fact, this effect size is as big as any drug that's ever been shown to have benefits in any mouse model of HD. All right, so moving away from Huntington's because it, it's not the focus today, we've taken these gene environment approaches into other mouse models of other brain disorders, including neurodevelopmental disorders. And we um, had a study many years ago where we provided the first evidence that environmental enrichment is beneficial in a mouse model of Rett syndrome, uh, which I, I won't show here. But other models we've looked at are mouse models of schizophrenia, which clearly is genetically extremely complex. Uh, we think there's potentially major epigenetic components and then obviously major environmental components, which when combined can lead to a brain that develops abnormally. And uh, in individuals with schizophrenia, they develop these cognitive deficits as well as negative and, and psychotic symptoms due to altered brain circuitry. So one of the models we've used for schizophrenia involves a homozygous mutation in this PLC beta one gene. And the way we got interested in PLC beta-1 was through its role that we demonstrated during critical periods of uh, postnatal cortical development and plasticity. And this was early work I did with Peter Kind in collaboration with the late Colin Blakemore. So Colin uh, was my postdoc mentor in Oxford and also a, um, a dear friend. And he died of motor neuron disease last year, actually. So uh, the world lost a, a great scientist and, and great science communicator, actually. And so uh, following on for that work, we characterized the mice that had this homozygous null mutation in PLC beta 1. And we found, um, together with uh, my second PhD student, um, Tara Spies, who's now uh, goes as Tara Spies Jones. And we were able to show that these PLC beta 1 knockout mice had uh, altered cortical development, including um, changes in synaptogenesis and, and other changes in the neocortex. And uh, through um, various lines of evidence, we, we think the upstream signaling involved uh, Inglar 5 and um, some muscarinic acetylcholine receptors. So Clements has nicely introduced synaptosomes, which we uh, extracted from the cortex of P7 and P21 wild type and PLC beta 1 knockout mice. And by using ligands to these metabotropic glutamate receptors and muscarinic acetylcholine receptors, we were able to show that the absence of PLC beta 1 disrupted signaling uh, through the MGLUARs at, um, at P7 and, um, and through the muscarinic acetylcholine receptors at, at both of these ages. Uh, then at the Flory, we um, characterized these mice in detail in terms of behavioral endophenotypes, and the work of Caitlin McComish and Emma Burrows was able to show a range of behavioral endophenotypes which map on to schizophrenia. So this is what we'd call face validity for schizophrenia, which maps on to clinical endophenotypes of schizophrenia. We were also able to show predictive validity. So giving these mice the drug um, clozapine, one of the most commonly prescribed antipsychotics still, or the atypical antipsychotics are generally closely related to, to clozapine, uh, we're able to show some benefits in this model, showing predictive validity for schizophrenia. So that was all under standard housing conditions. So the, we then looked and compared this with uh, environmental enrichment, which I've already introduced. Again, randomizing the wild type and the PLC beta one knockout mouse model of schizophrenia from weaning into uh, standard house versus environmental enrichment. And this is what you'd really want to be able to demonstrate in 
a preclinical model of a psychiatric disorder uh, that is thinking in this particular case of the PSC beta one knockout mice because we, they disrupt we think at least five important signaling pathways that have been implicated in schizophrenia. So in a way, we're modeling an aspect of the polygenic contributions of, of schizophrenia, uh, the negative genetic contributions in the knockout. And then in the standard house conditions, we're thinking of these as really sensory motor deprivation. There, it, standard housing is really a deprivation state relative to environmental enrichment. And it's only when you combine the negative genetic and environmental conditions that you get this fully penetrant schizophrenia-like model across multiple endophenotypes, including prepulse inhibition of acoustic startle or PPI, which is a measure of sensory motor gating. Uh, that's also um, found to be abnormal in clinical schizophrenia and found to respond to antipsychotic drugs in clinical schizophrenia as well. So we're able to model that in these mice, but also looking upstream at uh, MGLU5, these MGLU5 knockout mice also have a range of um, schizophrenia-like endophenotypes, so face validity and also predictive validity again, with clozapine, as demonstrated by um, Laura Gray, together with Emma Burrows and, and others. And also um, getting back to cortical development, just as we showed in the PLC beta-1 knockout mice, where they have abnormal barrel cortex development. So this is showing um, flat mount histology, uh, where you're able to actually visualise in primary somatosensory cortex the barrels representing um, whiskers from the contralateral um, side. And this is uh, the lovely appearance of barrels in a wild type mice. And both the MGLU5 knockouts and in fact the PLC beta 1 knockout have disrupted barrel cortex development um, that we're able to show as a sign that, as well as having these schizophrenia like endophenotypes, they have clear disruption of uh, near cortical development. We think hippocampal development as well. So doing this same paradigm now in the MGLU5 knockout mouse model of schizophrenia, Emma Burrows was able to show, importantly, in this uh, test, the Morris Water Maze, that we've used to model um, aspects of cognitive deficits relevant to schizophrenia in this um, test of long-term spatial learning and memory. Uh, importantly, Emma was able to show that this cognitive deficit in the MGLU5 mouse model of schizophrenia was corrected by environmental enrichment. Now, this is important because the cognitive deficits in schizophrenia are not only one of the greatest disease burdens, but also the cognitive deficits don't respond generally to antipsychotic drugs. So there's a huge unmet need. Even people who have positive symptoms and psychotic symptoms that in some patients may respond to antipsychotic drugs. Uh, that These drugs have terrible side effects, so they're a long way from perfect. But even in the, those that respond with their psychotic symptoms, their cognitive deficits generally aren't treated at all. So if we could work out how environmental enrichment corrects these cognitive deficits in schizophrenia, uh, we could use that to develop new therapeutic approaches for these cognitive deficits. Now, we want to understand cognitive deficits that are relevant to humans. So uh, early pioneering work was done by um, Jess Nithinatharaja, uh, originally in Cambridge with Tim Bussey and Lisa Succeeder. And um, we set up this at the Flory over a decade ago uh, and worked driven by my long-term collaborator, Emma Burrows. And what you're seeing here, uh, looking on the left side initially, are from the top, these touchscreen chambers. So it's essentially based on human CANTAB um, clinical neuropsychology. But if you look uh, at the top, it's actually looking down on these iPads or touchscreens and um, the visual displays presented there. And the mice then get to make a choice by touching their nose on the screen. So um, I'm going to play this um, again. So if you look on the left, the, the stimuli come up and the mouse touches and comes back at the, the back of the chamber and gets a, a strawberry milk reward. And so if you look now on the right, the two stimuli are gonna come up for a different mouse. And this mouse is gonna make the incorrect decision. It's gonna to touch the wrong stimuli. A little light comes on, so that mouse is trained. It knows it's not going to get a reward, doesn't even look for it. And so this allows you across a whole battery of cognitive tests, which are totally translatable to human CANTAB and other forms of neuropsychology, to measure um, specific human-relevant aspects of learning and memory, executive function and decision-making, as well as aspects of attention. 
And so what we've been able to do, um, firstly, in wild type mice with Ariel Zelezhnikov Johnson, we're able to show that environmental enrichment in wild type mice causes cognitive enhancement, which is relevant to human cognition. Ariel was all, also able to show that um, these mblue 5 knockout mice have cognitive deficits that are clinically relevant to the kind of cognitive deficits you see on these touchscreen-based CANTAB tests uh, in clinical schizophrenia. In a completely separate study, but this is part of our work where we're trying to relate, um, as Laura said, the brain to the body, in particular the microbiota gut-brain axis, uh, Carol Gebert was able to show that this mblue 5 knockout mouse model of schizophrenia has changes in the gut microbiome that are relevant to changes that have been recently shown in clinical um, schizophrenia. So we're, we're now thinking about this in terms of how we might understand not just abnormal brain development and function, but also abnormal brain body changes in, in these uh, mouse models of um, psychiatric disorders like schizophrenia. And finally, um, Xu Ting Li and Emma Burrows have generated a brand new test of attention based on the tos POSNA task um, that allows you to test a whole new um, domain of attention um, in mouse models. So this work with um, Greg Gibson and John McGrath, we put forward th this concept, uh, which goes right back to Waddington's concept of the epigenetic landscape, which Waddington was applying to development in general. Uh, the idea of this um, ball rolling down the hill being how an epigenetic landscape can impact on development. And we're thinking about this specifically in terms of brain development and the idea that um, through epigenetics, the development of the brain is experience expectant in that it expects certain environmental cues at certain stages based on what the particular species have has evolved to experience. And so this has um, been canalized, this brain development over a long time through evolution and, and genetics. And um, normally canalized brain development um, occurs via genetic and environmental instructional vectors. However, decanalization can occur due to the absence of expected instructions or environmental stimuli. And these might occur in utero or postnatally, or we would suggest um, that this decanalization could occur due to factors that um, your parents were exposed to, which relates to the, the last part of my talk. And um, so these um, absence of expected instructions might relate to um, a shift in, in global populations, for example, in environmental factors like diet, um, like levels of physical activity and sedentary behavior, uh, levels of chronic stress, which are obviously shifting in, in uh, modern populations, human populations. And this decanalization could also occur due to unexpected instructions like major stressors in utero, which we think might be relevant both to autism, schizophrenia, but also um, adolescent and postnatal stressors, which we think might be particularly relevant to schizophrenia and some other psychiatric disorders. I'm going to shift now onto the other topic that is uh, transgenerational epigenetic inheritance, where we've actually focused on paternal exposures and introducing the first paradigm, which we set up with Annabelle Short and Terence Pung. And we looked at giving these male mice for four weeks, either just normal drinking water or this stress hormone corticosterone, which is directly equivalent to human cortisol as a major stress hormone for four weeks before we bred them all with control mice, female mice, and then looked at the effects on the offspring and in fact on the, on the father's sperm epigenetics. And so the initial um, studies were quite striking in that increasing stress hormone levels, modeling stress in the fathers before conception caused um, in the male offspring increased anxiety on these two independent tests of anxiety-like behaviour. And so we then wanted to look at the sperm of the fathers to see what might be happening. And we have a lot of unpublished data now with DNA methylation. So uh, with Cora Fernandez and Terence Pung and Mike Clark, we've um, isolated the genomic DNA from the sperm of the fathers who've had the increased stress hormone or, or the controls and used nanopore sequencing to look at whole genome DNA methylation, but also hydroxymethylation. And we have a lot of data around that that I don't have time to show you today, but I can tell you that court does have effects. Uh, but also um, we've looked at extracting 
non-coding RNAs, in this case, small non-coding RNAs from the sperm of these two groups and doing transcriptomics on it. And what um, Annabelle found was that these uh, male mice that had increased stress hormone or caught had a range of different small non-coding RNAs that were altered, including these 87 microRNAs. And um, then looking at the brain tissues, in this case, the hippocampus of the F1 offspring, she could map particular microRNAs that had changed in the sperm of the fathers to uh, mRNAs that had changed in the hippocampus of the F1 male offspring, including um, BDNF and IGF-2, because microRNAs can bind to specific three prime UTR sequences in specific mRNA targets, hence controlling post-transcriptional gene uh, expression. And so this is an intriguing link that um, Annabelle and Terence found. Uh, in a separate study, uh, the fathers were giving increased exercise through wheel running or they were given standard housing. Uh, and so this exercise we found had specific effects on the offspring again, on particular affective and cognitive endophenotypes in the offspring. And again, looking at the sperm of the fathers and doing extracting the small non-coding RNAs and doing transcriptomics. There are a bunch of different small non-coding RNAs and not just microRNAs, but particular tRNA fragments that change with paternal exercise. And in a separate study, Shlomo Yesherin did environmental enrichment on the fathers. And strikingly, he showed changes with uh, paternal environmental enrichment that affected the F2 or grand offspring uh, in very specific ways. Now, this collaboration with um, Tim Brady at um, QBI and UQ, uh, we've now looked using um, Capture Seek, uh, looking at long non coding RNAs, this other major class of non coding RNAs in the sperm, and looking in this case at both the effects of court or stress hormone, but also the effects of exercise. This data is focusing just on the effects of court or increased stress hormone. And strikingly, there's a whole range of different long non-coding RNAs that are affected by increased stress hormone or court um, that um, Lucas Hoffman and Terence Pung have found. And uh, Lucas has also been able to show that the paternal court affects not just anxiety in the offspring, but social behaviours, which may be relevant to autism and a range of um, different offspring behaviours. And uh, in relation to a, a previous collaboration we've had uh, in this study, we're also using this approach of microinjecting these non-coding RNAs into fertilised mouse suicides to see whether there's um, a sufficiency of that microinjection in changing offspring phenotypes. And we're just analyzing that data now, uh, which is an um, exciting ongoing project. More of the work from Lucas has been able to show that as well as the social behaviors changing with paternal court, um, there are particular changes, for example, in these major urinary protein pheromones or MUPs that are caused by paternal court. So these are changes in the um, offspring uh, social behavioral phenotype, but also the offspring pheromones associated with that. And uh, Lucas and Terence have also been able to show that looking at the prefrontal cortex of the F1 male offspring uh, using mRNA transcriptomics, there's a range of different mRNAs that are altered. And um, sorry, this is too small to read, but there's a list of really interesting genes uh, whose expression has changed in the prefrontal cortex of the F1 offspring. And we think these might relate to both the anxiety and the um, changed social behavior in the offspring. So all of this comes together in terms of uh, informing this paternal transgenerational epigenetic inheritance in terms of how these environmental factors like stress and physical activity might alter sperm epigenetics and thus change offspring brain development, maturation and function, and possibly change risk and resilience with respect to a whole range of different brain disorders. We're particularly interested in how different environmental factors may um, send these signals via circulation, we think, down to the male germ cells to alter sperm epigenetics. And of course, um, female exposures are very important. That's a whole other area, uh, which is clearly important as well. And together, uh, maternal and paternal exposures could lead to either epigenopathy, increased predisposition to disorders via epigenetics, or in fact, epigenetic resilience. A completely separate study I won't go into in detail, uh, we've looked at Western-style diet, 
increased high fat, high sugar diet, following up earlier work from Margaret Morris and others. Um, Karina Bodden was able to show that this junk food or Western style diet in the father mice led to a range of different behavioral changes in the offspring. And in fact, um, interesting changes in the gut microbiome of the offspring that can be linked to those changed behaviors in the offspring. Uh, so, you know, these range of different studies with uh, changes in stress levels, in diet, in exercise, clearly have major public health implications. Sperm are extremely accessible cell population in humans, and we know increasingly that the th things that are happening in rodents appear to be also happening in humans. Uh, we need to work out the extent to which this is happening in humans. If this is generating epigenopathy in the next generation, we need to know how to prevent it. If it has transmitted to the next generation, we need to work out how to treat this um, epigenopathy. So this comes back to why any of this might have evolved and gets back to Jean-Baptiste Lamarck and uh, you know his theory of Lamarckian evolution. And clearly, you know, Darwinian evolution is the most um demonstrated um theory in, in the you know history of science really um so no one's questioning that but could we overlay Lamarckian elements onto Darwinian evolution and it's also a, a lesson in science that a lot of people um dismissed Lamarck even though um Darwin came later and had great respect for Lamarck's work and neither of them had any knowledge of genomics or epigenomics or anything that that we now know uh and yet Lamarck shouldn't have been dismissed out of hand because there appears to be uh, Lamarckian components overlaid on Darwinian evolution that we uh, really need to understand. And finally, uh, as I've said for a long time, we're all dealt a genetic deck of cards at conception that we can do nothing about. It appears now we're also dealt an epigenetic de deck of cards in conception. It appears that epigenetics may be perhaps more reversible uh, and you know, possibly therefore a therapeutic target. And the red arrows here, you can see individuals because of their genetics and epigenetics start to head down this pathway to abnormal brain maturation. Um, due to these positive environmental factors and um, neuro resilience and neuroprotection can um, be built up via brain and cognitive reserve. Someone who develops a dysfunctional brain may still be able to undergo functional compensation and someone who develops a brain disorder may need novel therapeutics such as environment medics they would be novel therapeutics which mimic or enhance the beneficial effects of environmental stimulation and a subclass of those would be exercise mimetics and this is an area we're particularly interested in the idea we might be able to harness the beneficial effects of exercise by understanding it right down to the level of molecules and cells so that we can develop novel therapeutics for a whole range of different disorders, including um, neurodevelopmental disorders. So finally, I'd like to thank the wonderful people who did all of the work that I've mentioned throughout my talk today. Um, those in bold are the, those who um, contributed to um, the work that I've shown today, but I'd like to pay tribute to them. Um, obviously, the, the past few years have been challenging in cities like Melbourne, but I know all over Australia and um, internationally and um, just incredibly inspirational the way they battle through many challenges and, and obstacles um, to, to do their science. Um, thank you for your attention.